So I suppose we could start with um, what's another year? Uh, what is this? This year has has it brought? It's hard to believe this time last year I was on my way to Italy watching the US Treasury sanction the Kinnahans on the phone as I was going through security with the headphones in and walking through the airport like that. Um, I'm actually due to go away again shortly. So I hope. Something might happen every time you leave the country. Something will happen to the Kinahan cartel. Um, So, no, we just thought we'd go over the kind of the year and what has happened since because the stories come fast and furious, don't they? And you kind of, sometimes you have to just ground yourself and and look at it chronologically as well to see where we are at with this. Now, as you just mentioned there before we came on, like before these sanctions, just in the the month and the weeks before it, Kinahan was planning, Daniel Kinahan was planning that interview with James English, the three hour long podcast was due to be released on St. Patrick's Day. And he was also standing around rooftops with Tyson Fury. And he was posing for pictures with Pakistani politicians. That's and right. Top yeah. boxers, well known, you know, no, not just Fury. And there was, I think, you know, top officials from the world of boxing and he was very much out in the open as a, as a boxing promoter and agency. And there was plenty of young boxers and not so young boxers who were singing his praises and for helping them revive their careers and bringing some money into the mm-hmm. game. So, I mean, he, he was well on his way to being a hero, certainly in, in boxing circles. So it was business as usual. It was, things were ticking along nicely in his campaign to sports wash his reputation as a, you know, a ruthless drug dealing killer. And of course, the run up to that, to go back a little bit further and particularly to that big interview he was giving on his terms. And I think English had been flown out. Now, that has never been broadcast apart from that small clip we saw where he does talk about where he was and how he escaped the Regency killers, you know, how he ran from them and he saw the gun and all this. But in the run up to that, there had been this massive marketing campaign run by Daniel Kinahan, where he's trying to become a legitimate player in the sports and business world. And there had been initially a book released, an online book, that the first person to tweet it was Johnny Morrissey, the lesser known kind of uh, criminal at that point, bar maybe ourselves. But the book came first. Then there was a rap song by Jay Spades. Um, which was all about the the Regency and this conspiracy theory that the media, the police and the government had conspired to murder Daniel Kinahan there. And it was something wrapped around the fact that Sinn Féin were getting into, were going to get into government and this was going to stop that. It was a big, big conspiracy theory. Um, So that was the song. And then there was a documentary released and then he stepped forward to do this interview and he was posing with Tyson Fury on the roof and everything looked so... Yeah, it looks hunky dory. It looks like he'd managed to flood the internet with yeah. different references that kind of described a different narrative from, you know, what was out there as, you know, the leader of a, an Irish mm. drug cartel involved in international drug trafficking. So here it was that if you really wanted to ignore the truth, you could find plenty of stuff online so that you'd be comfortable about taking the check or going to work for him. Mm. And that that's what it was. You know, it was pure sports washing, uh, reputation enhancement. I mean, some very expensive PR firms in London and Washington, no doubt, will be saying, if you want, you know, there's no point in trying to take on Google and get all this stuff removed. You, sh- you just have to start creating content that, you know, puts something different on the first 10 pages or the first 10 lines of Google, yeah. or certainly the first page. And I'm not saying it's easily done, but it can be done. Mm. And, and this is obviously what he was at. He, he didn't, obviously doesn't care about what people in, in the UK or, or Ireland particularly thought about him. But certainly in terms of, you know, now we know Mm. Like uh, people in other parts of the world, like in Africa and the Middle East, you know, if they were going to do a cursory quick search, they were going to find something different. You know, a legitimate businessman who's possibly getting into aircraft leasing or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Now, that, the confidence, <laughs> the confidence of him as well is there, was there. And there was a lot of reasons that confidence was there. I mean, clearly he shares, I think, some personality traits of his father. Um, I think he's definitely a narcissistic character. Um, you know, he surrounds himself with people who tell him he's right and he is, you know, highly functioning as a as a business man, albeit in, in a sort of an irregular world. But also, I always reckoned that the biggest disaster for police 
along the way with the Kinnahans was shovel, Operation Shovel in 2010. You were out in Spain at that time. I mean, at that stage, they were taken on and supposedly taken out by Europol. And the Spanish announced that it was the end of the Irish Mafia. And they were all dragged before the courts. And then they were released. And then the trudging Spanish legal system uh, got caught up. The magistrate had so much to, to look at that the lawyers that the Kinnahans were able to employ got them, you know, out of out on bail. They were signed on in Estepona. But the whole thing collapsed bit by bit. The more serious charges first. Then they started looking at other charges, which were lesser offences. And then it just wound down, shovel. And you see, the Kinnahans had told everybody when they were arrested that time, don't worry about this, we'll be fine, we'll get out of it. And, you know, while the media and police were going, no, 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 they're, they're goose now, they're over. They actually did win that. Pretty much, apart from an outstanding false passport charge against Christie Senior, which, yeah. you know, at the very least, or the, sorry, at the very worst, you'd get two years imprisonment in Spain, which I doubt anyone would get for that. Mm -hmm. Well, he might, but, you know, ordinary people wouldn't. But and to go back to what you said about Daniel Kinahan, you know, looking to give an interview, you know, the likes of, like, we both have given Christy Kinahan a chance to speak yeah. directly to the Sunday world. Um, certainly, we got him that time in, in Estepona when he was back to, he, he was back to sign on after that being released. That was about released. 2010 or 2011, was No, it, it was 2013. Because, was it? He, yeah. because of his arrest under operational shovel, he had to go back and serve his mm -hmm. time in Spain, or sorry, in, in Belgium. Yes. Because he'd, he'd broken the terms of his, his release, whatever. He obviously got in trouble with police. He had to go back and finish off. And that was for bribing police officers, you know, which again, looking back, should, you know, was a real signal of, you know, yeah. how, how big he, he, he was getting. Um, yeah, you know, he came out, he was pretty annoyed. I mean... It's funny at the time, like, you know, I took some footage of him going in with my mobile phone, which was almost an afterthought. Oh, I might as well take my phone out and get, get some footage of him. And it's the only footage that anyone has of him at all. Like, so. Um, and he I was, nearly well, knocked you out his umbrella. Well, that wasn't me. That was Paul Carlos, <laughs> right. the, the freelance photographer who yeah. was with me. But he an old school um, fella, like, you know, yeah. from Gibraltar. Um, and I, I was wearing a hidden camera, but I didn't have it on when he was going in because um, mm. I, I, I was hoping like we'll wait and we'll get him coming out and we'll see if he says something. And, you know, even he says one line, you know, with some kind of a story. But he, he so that that was on, you know, you know how tricky they are to, to wear and work. And, turn, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it wasn't on when he was going in. But when I waiting for him to come out, I had it on and he came out and he opened his mouth if he, as if he was going to say something and then thought nothing of it. And in the meantime, he changed his clothes. He was now wearing a dark, you know, a dark hat and, and glasses. From when he'd gone into the court to when he'd come yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and he came out, he opened his mouth. He thought of it better. And then he tripped over one of these little uh, traffic bollards. And that's when he kind of lost the rag a little bit and started trying to hit Carlos with the, Carlos the photographer with the umbrella and got into a black SUV and drove off. And we took a picture of a, a woman yeah. who was driving at the time. And as we now know, that's uh, Nessie Yildrum. Nessie Yildrum. Um, so we, we didn't we didn't know who she was at the time. But and that's now, his partner, of course, now, Christy Kinnahan. Yeah, and, and she's come up like in the last mm. year. Her name has been associated with some of their business dealings. So, I mean... She did, seems to be a Dutch-Moroccan lady. Yeah, there, there was quite the... A Turkish origin, a Turkish, I think, yeah. yeah. And, and would have had, like, does appear to have a legitimate business background. Mm. Yeah, so... And, uh, you know, it's been mentioned in some reports this year, I think they've had three children together as well. So, like, mm. you know, the... The Kinahan dynasty is is out there and going to continue to grow, like in, in that sense. He so, has I mean, quite a lot of children with quite a lot of women. Christy Kinahan Senior, those children. He was living down in Estepona with her, in the apartments which were the inside of which were shown during the shovel arrests. And if we can find that footage, we'll show that as well. But he was arrested, of course, in a pair of underpants. He was face down in the ground. But that was a very snazzy apartment complex down in Estepona and a witness that was there shortly before he went back to Belgium to serve out that sentence in between his release uh, on bail from the shovel arrest and before he went back to Belgium, described watching him playing with those children in a pool one day at that, you know, in, in, in the apartment complex. And he was throwing the kids around, but he was on and off the mobile phone. He was getting increasingly irate with whoever was on the mobile phone. And they described how he was kind of getting angry. And one of the kids was kind of crawling and jumping on over him the way kids do in a swimming pool. So he got the kid and he shoved the kid's head under the water. And the people around the pool were waiting for the kid, you know, to come back up, to explode back up. But it was just that instant too long. And everybody started to shift in their seats and go, 
you know, what's happening here? And the next thing up, the child came. I, I thought that was an interesting insight into his personality as well. You know, it's yeah, maybe he does feel stress. He isn't as. Well, yeah, but it's sort of the, you know, I suppose he look, at, you, you can't be a nice guy to be running the, an international trans global drug weapon, money laundering and murder machine like he is, you know, Um I went out after you then, I think it must have been to try and doorstep them. I can't remember when I went exactly, but they were signing on in Estepona and I had an interesting little time there as well. Of course, it was a street, a small street where this magistrate's court was. Um, I recall the magistrate arriving. It was a woman at the time. She was driving her own car. She parked it up in a little car park and walked up to the court. There was a, a, a guy uh, on the door, court, kind of out smoking like he was, certainly wasn't high end security. Um, she wandered in and the three Kinnahans then came along to sign on or were due to come along and sign on. I did think, wow, that's incredibly lax security for a magistrate here. Of course, the judges in the, um, you know, in the special criminal court are beneficial. I won't go into the details, but they do have security, especially when they're sitting like really top end security. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of curious. Now, I was I saw. Christy Jr. go in, he came out and did a runner. Uh, Daniel went in, I tried to speak to him when he came out and he put the baseball cap on and ran off up the street. Now, he wasn't afraid of me, obviously, but he certainly wasn't for talking. And Christy Sr. didn't show up that day. There was a roundabout, do you remember, at the top of the road? Yeah, at the top of the hill kind the of. The top yeah. of the hill. Yeah. And this Jag yeah. car or something very elegant looking went round it a few times. And I thought... It was Christy. I think he's quite distinctive looking, Kinahan Senior. And I thought he was driving it. It slowed down. It looked down, saw me. I had been standing in a kind of a doorway, but must have been out a little bit onto the street at the time and saw photographers waiting. And it was like as if this driver stopped, looked down and then thought better of it. Now, I stayed for the day and he never showed up to sign on. But when I rang the court later on in the day and I asked you know, for confirmation of who had signed on because I was there and Christy Kinahan Sr. did not go in and they told me all three had been. And I ins I said, I, well, I don't think Christy Sr. Yes, he said he insisted. The court insisted that he had signed on. He found another way to sign on. Well, you know, rather again. Rather than through the front door. Well, that was kind of a thought. Metaphorically or otherwise. <laughs> that, you know what I mean? I did think yeah. red flag, red flag, red flag mm. going on here. Like, I mean, this is this how you prosecute a massive big Mafia, a cartel. You'd I, never I mean, see that in any other in country. It's in complete contrast with when they were brought to court. Um, mm. Because, I mean, it was Kinahan, there was, there was Cunningham as well was brought. And there were, it was the, it was, the, I suppose, the Spanish equivalent of the ERU. Yeah. And these, these guys were in full tactical gear. They were pretty, they weren't aggressive towards the media that were there, but they were, you know, they were making sure we weren't getting in their way. Mm. And one of them, one of them had said something to one of our, one of the, my Spanish speaking colleagues who was there and it was something along the lines of watch out now there's one of them coming it's really dangerous and I think it was Christy Kenhan Jr and they seemed to be more right. frightened of so I don't know maybe do we could have mixed it up or lost yeah. it in translation but they were taking it really seriously I mm. mean these guys were it, it, you know the, the guns were out they had blocked the street the, you know there were every there were people were each each suspect was arriving individ, individually in armoured vans it looked like you know with the lights blaring the whole lot so Again, you know what you say about the the magistrate. You do wonder. Like, uh, I think the same magistrate, if I remember correctly, um, I, I saw her leave and get into a car. Um, as far as I remember, she looked like a person in her early early thirties or yeah. late twenties, yeah. and there was a baby seat in the back. I yeah. mean, so you, you know, you're I talking mean, about somebody on. who's who, who's you know you know potentially vulnerable. Like, to, to to we know now how big they are. I mean, even and then, how dangerous and how. Corrupt, you know, I mean, they have gone around the world yeah. corrupt, and, and they were talking about, you know, it being a billion billion dollar cartel yeah. at that stage. Mm. So you, you do think there might have been, you know, a slightly more more serious effort taken, I think, in Operation Shovel. So, But I spoke yeah. to people that would have been, you know, involved and, and, and who are, you know, still on the outskirts of the Kinnan organization now. And they talk about they'll never get them. Oh, no, they'll never get them. And you go, no, 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 they, they will get them. And I'm talking even in the last year. No, 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 they won't. They won't. And they, they're absolutely assured that they won't. And the reason for that, of course, is that that's not a perception. 
That's not a, it dreamed up in their head. That was the reality after 2010. This was Europe, all the forces of law of Europe coming down heavy on them, using all their resources, and they beat it. And, you know, then their narrative is all the more powerful. You know, when they're telling people there's no point in, you know what I mean? And I mean, they, they're not going to even have to say this directly to people. There's no point in you going to the police about us. We own the police. Yeah. I mean, and, and then, you know, really all we're hearing about the Kinhans after that then are, you know, their appearances in social media, uh, you know, and, and then it's just increasingly more and more, um, you know, Daniel becoming this boxing agent, you know, and so like. And, and, and as you said, with the Pakistani minister, like. Yeah. But as we now know, that yeah, all changed on all April changed. the 16th. I know, it's you know, amazing. The anniversary coming up. Um, and that was, as you say, you were going through uh, security on, on your, I guess, a holiday or working or yeah. something to Italy. No, it was, it was uh, to, holiday. Uh, like uh, like at the at the actual press conference, it was Im- impressive as well. Like, you know, I mean, the, the guards, you know, there was a big show of force. There was, I'd say... Every, you know, every spe- <clears throat> every special unit that was, has been involved were represented there, you know, and they were all there with their, in their suits, looking highly professional. There was tight security at the entrance. Um, and the idea that you had this kind of really high powered um, US delegation there, you know, including their ambassador to do a press conference, mm. you know, about an Irish criminal shows you just like how serious they were taking it. So, I mean, it was quite, it, it, it was quite the event in, in that sense. And it was like, and that alone, I think, was a victory for the guards in that they now had a really big dog on their team, yeah. which is the Americans. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, and so, I mean, that all came out. And then we, we, you know, we see Morrissey, you know, raising his head, all the various companies, front companies that they were using in Dubai. Uh, so, of course, the pictures on the screen that day, there was obviously Christy Kinahan Sr., Christopher Jr. and Daniel Kinahan with five million dollar rewards under their mugshots. And then the others named in the sanctions was Ian Dixon, who's a cousin of the Kinahan brothers, uh, who actually was a coach, a, a boxing coach in MGM gym in Marbella for years before he moved on out to Dubai with them. And he has been running Hopo Sports, I think it's called. Um, it was Hopo. one of the yeah. Hopo. It was one of the sporting companies that was mentioned. Um, Johnny Morrissey, who was uh, sanctioned originally. A Mancunian, I think, criminal who was originally based here in Ireland and can sail for some time before moving out to Marbella um, and the owner of Nero Vodka, which had been set up in recent years out there. Um, Bernard Clancy, a little known player somewhat, although a childhood friend of the Kinahan brothers from the Hardwick Street area who had been in Spain with them all these years, I think jailed there in the early 2000s for a number of years for drug offences, um, but has been like this loyal slave nearly to Daniel Kinahan throughout his life. And Sean McGovern finally was also named and he's wanted here for murder. And despite that, there is a European arrest warrant out from the Emiratis have yet failed to lift him. Uh, he's still in Dubai, but nonetheless, that's what's happened. That's who are named. Um, so that was a big, huge moment, really. And for boxing as well. And they all ran for the hills. Well, I mean, MTK folded very much like, you know, w- within a very short space of time after that. I mean, their statement was, look, we've done nothing wrong, but, mm. you know, we, we can't do business under these uh, circumstances. I think what really hit a lot of people connected with the boxing world was suddenly the emergence of this no-fly list. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Americans were saying, like, you guys aren't coming if you've been involved with Guinan. And slowly there's been a kind of a drip feed, you know, of, about who's been on that list because nobody knows until they go to try and get on a flight and they're told, I'm sorry, you can't board. You're mm-hmm. not being allowed on by the US. Um, so we, we've had, you know, the likes of Tommy Fury saying he couldn't fight Jake Paul in the States because, like, he was on this no-fly list. And, you know, not, he's not involved in crime, but, you know, he was he, he was associated with MTK and, you know, and, you know, associated with Daniel Kinahan. Mm. So, I mean, and there's so many others. Tyson, like, the big story, and that was a couple of months after the sanctions, he yeah. tried to board a flight in the UK to go to the States. And, I think and, he was testing the waters. And, yeah, and there's been others. And yeah. I'd say there's there's others still are a little bit concerned. They, they haven't actually gone to the States yet. Yeah. And that includes like some, 
I, I'd imagine some fairly well known boxing promoters haven't haven't ventured back to the US in the meantime. For sure, I mean they have to kind of you know <laughs> they, they have to be careful um, you know with their associations, I guess you know. And, they, and as you say, like I mean, like they they, they ran for the hills. They I did. Mean, we haven't heard from Daniel since you know from his regular tweets and his you know or his uh, posse uh, of of you know, choir boys and you know various people putting up. You know, pictures of hanging out with, you know, a drugs baron and thinking it's great. So, I mean, mm. that's all disappeared. It's gone off. And Bob Aaron. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry, there's, I can't remember his name now as well, but the president of one of the, the major boxing associations oh, as well, yeah. the Mexican gentleman. So, I mean, these are all people that, you know, we, we try to contact them saying, yeah. do you know who you're posing with? And they just ignore us and wouldn't wouldn't talk about it. But now. And defended him. They defended yeah, yeah, him. So, some did. Yeah. Mm. Those who did come back would defend them. Otherwise, they just ignore it. And, mm. you know, there was no question of taking down tweets or, or trying to clarify things. And, you know, behind the scenes, one or two people, you know, had hired, you know, in particular, you know, some fairly high powered PR person in London who would, you know, drag it out to try and not tell you anything. Mm. And then. You, you get a legal letter over my, my client has got nothing to do with international drug dealers, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you know, when they clearly had. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, th- that was all gone on in the background. Obviously, we can't write about some of that too much. No, but I mean, and indeed, like, Daniel Kinnan would have been capable, or certainly yeah. companies related to him, to writing legal letters over the years to journalists. They all sort of yeah. were and, put and into a, the. And in fairness, of some of our our. our our colleagues in in you know who cover boxing. I mean, Kieran Cunningham, I think, deserves a mention as well. Mm. You know, I mean, some of them have been really good. You know, they've been at press conferences since, and they've they've, they've come out and asked. You know, why hasn't the questions? Like, yeah, you know, he's he's asking these questions. You know, and and I think they can't be allowed to forget about it. Although no, and of course, you see what the ones that defended him. What do they say now? Like, what, you know, do they still or do they, you know, do they apologize for defending him? No, I just think they just they just avoid it. They it don't just, they? just ignore the topic. Yeah. Like they, yeah. no, no one's going to address it. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's. I guess it's twofold. One, you don't want to make them angry, and mm. two, you don't want to drag it up again. I mean, if you were working as a peer advisor for these people, you'd be possibly telling them one or the other. It's either to go all in and criticize them. You know, it's a bit like being a. I think a, a Russian blogger. Like you, you know, you don't really criticize Putin unless you're already in Switzerland or somewhere safe. Now the career of of Tyson Fury is still up there but uh, that Anthony Joshua bout never happened or did it happen I can't remember now Over it's not a sport year. I follow closely no, Nicola I'm but I mean like, like when, you, when you consider I mean in, in one sense like Tyson Fury like like he's Irish I know he's, he's grown up in the UK but he's he's he Irish, Irish. He's, he is he's, don't he's, be claiming he's him people. but that's the point if it was anyone else and yeah. if they hadn't been so connected with Daniel Kinnan he would be celebrated you know so I mean like not that he needs the money, but I mean, I mean, there's no endorsements. He's not mm. going to be opening any businesses in, no. in in Ireland anytime soon. And you know, we'd certainly be claiming him. Like, I mean, I mean, the 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 British are constantly claiming our people. They like, are. You know, they are. whether it's in acting or anything. And I think we'd be justified in trying to claim Tyson Fury of uh, as one of our own if we were proud of him. But I don't. I think people are we're kind of quite happy we can kind of keep him at arm's length and that he's he's not really Irish, but he's as Irish as as, as any of our any of our uh, well, a lot of our rugby players and a lot mm, of our mm. soccer players. Yeah. So the box that was boxing and, and, you know, boxing has continued to be concentrated, a lot of it within the Emirates. And, and that's a whole different story, really, what's happening with boxing and the regulations. And I, I don't think boxing cleaned itself up after it. I think it just carried on regardless and just, you know, thought this was just a blip. In, in operations uh, with Kinahan, they just... It's not even a blip. I mean, boxing has yeah. often been associated with criminal figures down through the years. I they mean, just saw it as know, it's, it's just, I mean, mm-hmm. like in fairness, uh, boxing clubs are probably the only sports that are exist in some areas of, you know, extreme social deprivation. So you're going to have people with baggage, um, you know, just to be fair to boxing yeah, as a yeah. sport. So, I mean, you're not going to be able to keep people out mm-hmm. of, of of a sport. You know, I mean, most trainers will, will say, like, if somebody's not bringing trouble to the gym and they're 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 putting it on, you know, they're they're putting in the effort, you know, in the ring. What's happening outside is is nothing to do with it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, there's an element of you know, sports people should be role models for young people and so on, but. It, it doesn't always hold up, you know. It, it, I mean, you could, there's an awful lot of professional sports people out there who are anything but. So like, why should boxing be held to a different standard? Mm. So we want to talk really about what else has happened since that, um, you know, what else has happened since outside of the boxing since these sanctions. 
So the next thing that happened was this IC. IJ, the, the, the International, International Consortium. Consortium for International Journalists. They, you know, the this is all kind of like the Panama Papers. This is this huge dump of data taken from you know, a Central American law firm that was mm. basically looking after the rich and infamous and notorious people like who were trying to hide their money. Um, and, and, you know, and, and stuff has percol percolated out from, you know, some of these data dumps uh, about the Kinahans and about some of the companies that they were using mm. in Africa in particular, uh, which they were basically trying to set up a, you know, a, a fleet of private aircraft so they could move cocaine from the western coasts of Africa uh, further north and then use that as a route for bringing cocaine from South mm -hmm. America into Europe. Um, there was one air ambulance firm that was up and running, something like 12 aircraft. Um, this was the, in Malawi. This 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 came out it came out of Malawi. Yeah. The story did, but and investigators uh, uh, I think in Malawi themselves were working on this and digging on it as that's well. That's right, yeah, Nyasa Air. Um, but they weren't they weren't limited to uh, Malawi. They were they were operating you know across kind of Western and Northern Africa. And then there was also then a separate company where they were looking at buying these um, Egyptian ex-military aircraft, which mm -hmm. would have you know seriously amplified their capability of lift. I mean, these were, they're all, they're American aircraft. They're, 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 they can lift something like 13 tonnes, but they can, you know, land on a sixpence. You know, they're, they're able to get into rough terrain, mm -hmm. um, uh, runways or airstrips or fields or whatever. So, I mean, these are the type of, of aircraft you could use anywhere. So it'd be perfect, for, you know, for, for landing, you know, close to a coast and, you know, flying where you need to go. And obviously they'd have the wherewithal to, to organise you know, uh, a safe route, you know, over airspace of different countries, particularly in, you know, some of the poorest countries in the world, yeah. you know, very so corruptible, corruptible governments. Yeah. And, yeah. and for, for the likes of Kinahan, that would be no issue. I mm -hmm. mean. And a lot of this aviation stuff was linked to Christy Kinahan Sr., who, of course, we discovered was posing as an aviation expert going to conferences in Dubai. He appears to have gone to the Gulf before his sons, probably when he was released from that Belgian jail. He was out there by the time the kid, the two brothers go in the weeks after the regency but he was running think, a company and I mean there were there were like some of the papers that came out during operation shovel in 2010 there was companies with links to to Dubai so I mean okay, they already so had an, an association mm. with with Dubai I mean there, there were certainly there was talks of like huge consignments of concrete and bananas mm. which were being shipped or certainly brokered through Dubai by various companies so I mean they had that association there. So obviously, as you say, Christy was in the middle of reinventing himself, certainly to, to people who weren't Googling his name too closely or looking at Irish websites. And he was uh, operating under the name, of course, Christopher Vincent, which was his, you know, and, and quite openly. And I think myself and Niall went and found a lot of his social media accounts and we discovered that he was yeah. actually posting a lot of this kind of, he was a big conspiracy theorist. He was anti-vax. He was anti-big pharma. You know, some of the things that are yeah, you wonder about his the state of his mind in a sense that, you know, is he the legitimate businessman and we're all the corrupt business people? Yeah. You know, and is that how you, oh, you that's really how you, that's how you get to sleep at night, <laughs> you know, when you kind of turn things on their head and you're not the baddie, you're actually the rebel, you're the maverick, you're the outlier, mm -hmm. whatever way, you know, you want to try and fix it up in your own head so you can keep things on the straight and narrow in, 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 the, in those terms. But I, one of the things that uh, in May, uh, like what you say a month after it was, um, I managed to get talking to a former official of the of OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control in the States. Yeah. And and one of the one of the takeaways from that conversation was that he pretty much thought there's already an indictment against the Kinnahans that has yet to be unsealed, which is the way the US works, which means that somewhere a prosecutor in the US has gone to a grand jury um, and shown whatever evidence they've had. And that jury then have now said, yes, this man has a case to answer. So that would be under those RICO laws. It could be under anything. We don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, and that's the, that's the point. I mean, like, I mean, we've certainly speculated about the, the USC Guyane, which was this massive co um, cocaine seizure. I think it was it 2019? In Philadelphia. In, in Phil yeah. And uh, there was, and there's some amazing detail that's come out of that about, yeah. you know, the speedboats off the coast of Peru, you know, going back and forth over three different nights on the journey south to, to Chile on the way back again. Um, and they stopped off. It was destined for it. It, it wasn't destined for the US. It was destined for for Europe. But mm. the, the fact that they stopped in Philadelphia, and obviously they knew it was coming. 
and they, they it was a huge operation to search the ship like i mean the, it's an absolutely enormous ship it's one of the, it's like the one that say if you remember the evergreen that blocked the, the, the Suez, Suez Canal, yeah. which everyone saw pictures of that. So yeah. the USC Guyane is one of these like giant cargo ships. So like a human being looks like an ant on it. They're, they're just enormous. Mm. Like, you know, and and th there was uh, some more detail ca recently came out about that as well and about how they had to organize, you know, searches of that scale and even to find a place to park the ship in a place where they could keep it secure. Right. All kind of presented these huge logistical problems. Um, but like they're, 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 the Americans wrapped that up. I think they they got all the crews. I think there was nine people jailed. There was another another um, Montenegrin flying through the U.S. He was the most recent arrest, um, who you know wasn't on board the ship, but mm. they've managed to track him down through the connections, and he's now accused. So we we do know that this was part of the super cartel. Ed Gassinen again, you know, has been linked to this. Um, you know it. it it fits in with the other style of the way they've been bringing stuff in through Rotterdam and mm. Antwerp and, you know, the control of the shipping. Uh, now, they're, they're moving on from that since, we know. Um, but th th this very much looks like it could be what's going to bring the Kennehans down, whether it is or not, you know. I'd well, you see here on the Wanted wrong. posters, right? <laughs> this is Daniel Kinnahan's what I'm reading from here. So uh, the reward has been offered of up to five million do US dollars from the Department of State the money is for information leading to the financial disruption of the Kinahan criminal organization or the arrest and or conviction of Kinahan. So they're going for the money. Yeah, I mean, the Americans are going for the business. They're going for the money. Yeah, I mean, that's been that's always been, I think, the way, you mm -hmm. know, is follow the money because, uh, I mean, that's that's why they're in it. So, I mean, if you, you know, it's kind of follow the money all the way home. I, mean, it's, it's I might just, as well take know. this opportunity to read out the, sorry, the email address that you can give your information to. Anybody who has tips, send via email to Kinahan, that's a capital K, uh, uh, higher case T-C-O-T-I-P-S at DEA.gov. That's the tip line. You'd love to see it, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'd love Imagine to have a look at that email. At the other end of that email, it'd be absolutely <laughs> incredible. Yeah. But anyway, so that's there. That's for a year that email has been open, and, and you know we don't know what's going into that. But no doubt, there's a few people interested in claiming those five million dollars. Um, so right, so we discovered through the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, this interest in Africa, and of course the transport routes of drugs are second only importance to the production of them. Like the, owning a transport route is mega, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a third. It's a third of the through. business. I mean, it's you have absolutely. to you have to produce it. You have yeah. to ship it. Mm -hmm. You have to get it to market. Like mm -hmm. you, then, you have to sell it, and so you have Kinnans to you have to launder it. the money. So, so the Kinnans I mean, were getting it to market, and they were then attempting to own part of the transport route. So the only thing they weren't doing. Before it's growing the, it. It's growing it. Well, we don't know that. Who's to say they True. haven't bought out gangs yeah. or fields, and yeah. they pretty much are the owners of. Of Parts the, of, of Chile, the production. <clears throat> because yeah, weren't, of course they were they were in shovel in 2010. They had bought up a section of Brazil. Yeah, I mean it's well within their capability. Mm. So I mean, and and like and we know from the likes of uh, is it Ion Grillo? And, yeah, you know some of his the work that they've been doing. You know, explaining about how fractured the the cartels or the gangs in 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 South America have become that have given the opportunity to European gangsters mm. to come in and you know all of a sudden. They're not going in with their hand out, you know, worrying whether it's going to be chopped off or not. Now they're coming in and saying, we have bags of money. We can get you to our market. Mm -hmm. You you give us the stuff. And, you know, it's quite possible some of these producers might have needed a capital investment, you know, to, to get up and running. You know, because they, they are under pressure. They are being hunted to some extent. They've got to pay off officials in their countries. Um you know, the Americans, I suppose, keep them under pressure in, in that sense as well. We've all watched Narcos, mm, mm. you know, and, and it has moved around. You know, it's, it, you know, this business, it isn't static. It isn't like, you know, the same couple of farmers are producing all these cocoa fields. Like they're moving from, you know, different parts of Colombia, then depending on whether a peace deal is signed with whatever, um, you know, faction of FARC or, you know, with the, with the government, they'll move then to some other part of, of Peru. And again, you know, it could be one that's controlled by corrupt government officials or it could be the Shining Path guerrillas, you know. So, mm -hmm. I mean, these are all these kind of things that, you know, th you know, it's, it sounds perfect for the likes of Kinahan to negotiate. You know, they seem to be able to, to do business, you know. For sure. And speak the languages of all sorts of different uh, jurisdictions. Now, we moved through the summer and into September, October. There was just deathly quiet from Dubai. Um, some of us were 
couple of contacts were able to say that they were kind of carrying on somewhat normal. There was all sorts of rumours that the Kinnahans were on the move, that they were going to move to various places. Of course, part of the ICIJ discovery was that Kinnahan Sr. was uh, hoping to relocate to Zimbabwe some years ago and he was going to, he bought property there and he was going to move along with Nessie Yildrim, his, yeah. his partner. Um, and that just didn't happen for him. That that came undone. That was part of his aviation dream. But we moved through the summer into the autumn and come winter in November, the next big news. Am yeah. I jumping something? No. It, like, yeah, we learned about it in November, yeah. which was Operation Desert Light. Um, and this, again, was, you know, cooperation between Dubai and Spanish authorities and Dutch authorities. And... Ed Gassanen was one of those, he was one of six people arrested in, in Dubai. So, I mean, this is, that was pretty much a huge development, you know, in terms of, uh, I think it would have me it meant that, that, you know, Daniel or Christy are the last members of the super cartel standing. They're the last ones that haven't been picked up mm. somewhere or are not in jail. And Gassanen, of course, is the Balkan connection. He's the <coughs> head of the Tito and Dino cartel who uh, was at the table with Kinahan. Kinahan's idea was this European super cartel, which essentially was the meeting of the, the various crime families, um, the merging of their resources, simple business plan, really, uh, with the Dutch, the Italian, the Balkans and, and the Irish and Kinahan senior at the head of it. Um, it meant they could, you know, whoever had money laundering facilities, they could all use them. Whoever had the connections to buy the stuff, they could all use them. Everything was shared, essentially, and then including the profits. So the police obviously believed they, they had taken over up to one third of Europe's cocaine market. Um, now, Europol announced after this operation Desert Light when 49 people were arrested across six European countries. Uh, we were told about this in November. It had happened in when did you say September, October? It, it happened the month before. The, so it the, the, the arrests, like yeah. we, we learned about the arrests, or it was announced, a like month a, a, a month, more so or less Europol a month after. So said, like came out and said, <clears throat> basically in a statement that they had dismantled, that this th this operation had dismantled the European super cartel. So now Gassanen, sorry, uh, was Johnny Marcy caught up in this? No, but there was another money launderer, right? And that, that was. Um, a fellow called uh, Ryan James Hale, oh, yeah, who was a it, British yeah. national. Mm. Um, and then more details have come out of this. But uh, again, it was Operation Desert Light. So he was arrested as, as, as part of this. Um, and that all, all went back to an intercepted um, cocaine shipment from Panama. Uh, and then it was through the Encro chat smash, whatever, cracking Hack, of, of yeah. that. And so they, they were able to get details of that organization. And then when they looked into Hale, there was a second side to him and that was Pretty much he was in charge of a major money laundering operation as well as his role in getting the cocaine from Panama into the ports in, I think it was Valencia or Barcelona. That so they he's were very se for. senior yeah, partner. And, and, like. Yeah, and had apparently had, had been to the to, to UAE, was considered like, you know, a key man mm -hmm. for the cartel in 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 Europe, and but also in Dubai as well. And we hadn't really heard a whole lot of about him before. But no. There was stuff came out since in some of the Spanish papers. They've had access to screenshots of of the the messages, and um, it, it kind of it, it gave you a really. I mean, it was basically there was one part they were wondering, like you know, uh, the the drugs had they been seized by the police, or you know, or had they been taken by a rival gang, and so and mm. then there was also. Um, I think Hale was was worried about he was getting he was being targeted by rival gangsters, and also he was worried he kept been getting picked up by the police, which obviously turned out to be. Turned out to be right. Mm. I mean, a 32 year old, like he was driving a 300 grand Lamborghini, lives in mansions, plenty of jewelry, you know, like he, 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 he wasn't exactly uh, he wasn't keeping it low. It. And the Spanish police said they had, they had, in two years, they had done 10 tons of coke. Like, so this is this cell that's linked to right. the cartel. So that's worth 760 million that they brought to the company. So in you Hale mentioned, cell. so you mentioned, yeah. like, in terms of, they said it was about a third, the super cartel, they think it's about $30 billion or mm -hmm. euro, sorry. 30 billion euro uh, uh, worth of cocaine that they've brought to market. So that's the scale that you're talking about. Mm. Um, now, one of the unusual things, that, and that was actually, Gasson was actually wanted by the Dutch authorities. Yes. And, and there was a bit of a wrangle over that in that Dubai said the paper wasn't put together properly and he's since got bail. 
Um, and I think the Dutch were pretty upset over that, saying, no, they were denying that they had gotten anything wrong so in terms of the extradition. As far as I understand it, because I have been looking at it, he's bailed and he's in Dubai still. Yeah. Um, but like, but the, the, the warrants are still out there for him, or whether mm. or not the Dutch have filed new ones or not, I don't know. Or whether the Dubai police are necessarily going to find the same enthusiasm to go find him again remains to be seen, depending on you know what's happened. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that was, I suppose, in one sense, um, the Kinnans might have taken a little bit of cheer from that, that, you know, just because you're, 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 you're done by the Dubai police on, on the foot of a, a, an arrest warrant from Europe doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go down. But uh, unfortunately, then there was some worse news to come for them the following month. Yeah. So whatever comfort they took out of Ed Gasson and getting out in bail, I think, was, was pretty much ruined by the news that Raphael Imperiale had come a, a pentito. Mm -hmm. which is basically, he's now a state's witness um, and it's a huge move. It was major news in Italy where, you know, you basically had one of the most senior men from the Camorra uh, who, you know, helped one particular clan in a really bloody feud. He weighed in uh, and basically helped them become the dominant clan mm -hmm. within this, you know, consortium of criminal clans based out of Naples. And and he was the top dog, like, you know, and, and you're the top dog in this world because you have access to the cocaine, you've access to the money. And so for him to turn state's witness is absolutely huge. Mm. Um, and, you know, what's going to come out of his mouth, you know, is going to be very interesting. Obviously, it's going to be all about the Italians initially. That's what they're after. There was a bit of messing with his extradition as well, because there was didn't the Italian. The justice minister, justice minister paid, paid a to visit and, it wasn't, Dubai, and yeah. it wasn't until after that that right. it was done. So yeah. you'd love to be a fly on the wall for these you'd conversations. Love to know what's exactly. happening with the Emirates. Yes, like, I mean, are they just... Are they really that by the book that if there's one line wrong in a extradition paper that they release these people? I look, I mean, all governments are going to play, a, you know, a certain amount of politics with yeah. high profile prisoners. Now, obviously, you know, within the EU or the, you know, the US, if someone's a criminal, you know, there's no question of, of playing anyone playing politics. But you see it with this kind of hostage taking in, yeah. you know, the likes of Iran and, and Russia, you know, where... Innocent citizens are picked up and they use as bargaining chips for some particular reason. And, you know, the Iranians, I think, had some British people locked away for years on the basis that they wanted this 800 million back, you know, from the previous, the Shah's government from 1979, who'd ordered military equipment and the, the English had never given the money back. So, I mean, that was a simple transaction, you mm -hmm. know, why mm -hmm. people were getting arrested. So, I don't know, is there is there something behind that? Or, you know, are, are there politicians in Dubai who might be using you know, the clamor for these guys getting arrested and, and trying to squeeze some kind of concessions, commercial concessions or legal concessions from EU-based countries. So I, that, I, I don't know if we're ever going to find that out. Um, never will, but I, I mean, it's a question you worth know, asking, you know. It's definitely, uh, you know, it's interesting when you see them. Now, of course, with Raphael Imperiali safely back in Italy and he has six months to give the authorities in Italy the full statements and everything he knows. And for in order for him to comply with his witness protection, essentially, and to get his deal, because, of course, he's doing it to save his own skin because he doesn't want to spend the rest of his life in jail. But he has to give up everything he knows. He has to tell everything he knows. And he is somebody who is has been at the head, neck and tail of the finances of the European super cartel of Daniel Kinahan's business of Rido and Taji's business and, of course, of Eden Gaston's business. So the next six months and what he has to say, it's all been written down at the moment. Uh, can you imagine reading that? Um, some of it has come out. I think I think the Italians, first and foremost, want them for the prosecutions that will follow on the members of the Camorra Mafia. But he'll be of use in the Netherlands. He'll be of use in Ireland and wherever else these people are being brought. But, you know, if the headache wasn't bad enough, you've got the sanctions in April you have the uh, the constant flood of information about the Kinahan's businesses that's coming through journalists, coming through polices, coming through other trials that are happening in the Netherlands. You have Gasson and Lifted, you have Imperiali back going straight witness. The previous September, Johnny Morrissey goes dark because he is picked up, of course. He is named as the chief money launderer for the Kinahan organization in Spain. He's accused of laundering more than 300 million in drug money for them every year. He, his wife was arrested with him. Nero Vodka collapses, closes down. And he's in jail facing a massive, big, long sentence. And for me, he'd be my bigger worry because 
Like, he's a bad egg, Johnny Morrissey. He always has been. You I'm, know, like, I mean, he, he was one of the early serving. targets for Cab. And, yeah. you know, we were told they, he was linked to, uh, I think, I, I can't remember the figure, but it was double figures in terms of murders in the UK gangland. And that yeah. was his reputation. And that I mean, came from Felix McKenna, the then head of the Criminal Assets Bureau. That wasn't just a journalist no. plucking this number from the sky. That was, there was certainly about 30 murders he was linked to. He, yeah, he was a serious player. Like, yeah. and, and, you know, you know, Johnny Cash, as they nicknamed him, you know, running around, you know, you know, West Cork with a suitcase full of money. Yeah, you know, it's just the biggest belief, you know, and mm. he had his, his ridge boat. He was nipping out to sea to pick up what they, you know, looks like uh, cocaine, cocaine shipments, shipments and yeah. working for the Russians at that yeah. time. So, I mean, this is a guy who's been you know, working at the top end of international drug dealing, you know, for whatever that is, 30, mm. 40 years at this stage, you know. And of course, when he was targeted by the Criminal Assets Bureau, he was very annoyed and uh, he was involved in a plot to kill Barry Galvin, the then legal officer, who was the first civilian in Ireland to probably ever have been issued with a firearm for his own safety. Yeah. Um, so he, after the Criminal Assets Bureau took what they could, he went to Spain and he's been over there. I mean, you talk about bling. He is, uh, has been eye-watering. Like, it's not just, he just has that look of a gangster, doesn't he? He's a big fat belly and a bald head. He's only short of a cigar sticking out of his mouth. Um, was building a huge, big monstrosity of a house with statues of Nero everywhere, out and about on the Marbella social scene with his glamorous Scottish wife, Nicola. And... They were very public about their money, their wealth, everything. And yeah, he is gone from that to the cells of Al Horin del Torre prison, which is out in the, uh, it's not a desert, but it's. Well, it's out in the sticks. Yeah, the sticks. but it's accessible a little bit. We, yeah. I think we both visited. It's <laughs> pretty grim though. Get a pig. Ah, yeah. No, he doesn't, it doesn't look like a place you want to spend any time no. ever. And he's in his it's 60s a, <clears throat> and his wife was arrested and she has since been released without charge. I think the investigation is continuing into it all. But, you know, the future ain't bright for Johnny Morrissey. And uh, is he going to take it? Is he going to suck that up? Is he going to spend the rest of his life in jail or is he going to talk? I mean, I, well, I think time is running out for people to talk. Uh, I mean, it was it was always going to be who's going to crack first. I mean, you're not going to get off anyway. Mm -hmm. But you're certainly not going to get a sweetheart deal with any law enforcement if you're kind of the fifth or fourth math in, man in offering yeah. information. And then if you're not high enough in the hierarchy, you're, you're you're not much use either. So I mean, you want someone pretty high level who's gonna who's going to you know go state's witness. And I mean, I think we we might have seen that with Raphael Imperiale. I mean, you're not going to get higher. I mean, like he's a like he's he's a partner of Kinnan. Like yeah. he he didn't work for him. Like these yeah. were partners. Um, so I mean, his information would be you know, a far greater import. Now, who's who's to say whether he'll turn up in the US to give, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a witness statement against the Kinnans if, mm -hmm. you know, if they can. I mean, all all that has to be that'll hammered come, out. I mean, that'll be politics as well, won't it? You of know, course it Italians will. Yeah. And, the bargaining chip and, and, right now. and it will be and it will be up to the Italians to decide whether or not Imperiale has been cooperative enough. Mm -hmm. And they might say, well, look, let the Americans do their own business. We've done our business. And and sometimes you, you get that. And you get that in, in some countries. We're not all as, you know, American loving as we are here in yeah, Ireland, which yeah. is why Joe Biden's coming this week. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people, they like to show that they're independent. And, you know, uh, the Americans sometimes, you know, like to kind of remind everyone just how big they are, which in this case, I think, you know, in terms of the Kinnan, that's what was needed to, mm -hmm. to finally get the ball rolling. Because, I mean... I mean, how many times, I mean, we're writing about them for 20 plus years saying, you know, how come no one else is really picking up on this? Do they, anyone realize how big they are? Have they really, you know, you're starting to second guess yourself, like, totally, you know, in terms totally. of, have they actually beaten the whole thing? Or is, is this going to be, you know, this guy going to be running around the place, you know, standing in Las Vegas beside some famous heavyweight boxer, like, you yeah. know, handing over trophies and celebrating and, and you're kind of going, how could that happen? And, yeah. You know, thank God somebody, someone out there was listening. And Behind the scenes, yeah. the job, the job was being done and the, you know, it's been a slow, methodical job by law enforcement. And I mean, even really since these sanctions, it has been a slow, methodical, trudging yeah. thing to get them. But um, I we, mean, we, the, we actually got a glimpse of that this week with Drew Harris at the Association of Garger Sergeants and Inspectors Conference. Yeah. So like just on um, 
I think it was, what day was it? It would have been, sorry, 4th of April he was speaking at that. Um, and, he, and he was talking about the significant advances that have been made in bringing charges against the Kinahan cartel. And he previously said he doesn't care where they're charged, whether it's in, in Ireland or in a, in a mm-hmm. foreign jurisdiction, once they get done. And he said, particularly in Europe, you know, um, a lot of progress has been made, but also with the U.S. federal law enforcement partners, as, he, as you refer to them. And he said, there is a lot, you know, there is action in this and it keeps on moving forward. Every month I'm updated on progress between ourselves. We're still working very closely. He says, it's, it's the work is carries on. We always knew this would be a difficult target, but it's much diminished from what it was a year ago. So that was his key mm-hmm. phrase. They're much diminished. Yeah. And like, you know, I thought it was odd when Drew Harris initially came out with the thing saying that they wouldn't be charged here. Is that what he said? They wouldn't no, be charged no, he, here? He's he, said he, they, he doesn't care where they're he charged. He doesn't care where they were like, charged. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Irish police have been working for the last, since 2016, with, they've been investigating Daniel Kinahan in particular and connecting him to um, to murders and to feud activity and to directing a criminal organisation. And they haven't been working just to not charge him. Like, I mean, I, I personally, if I put my money on it, I would tell you that I think Daniel Kinahan's coming home here. I think he's for here. I think him and Sean McGovern obviously is because we've a, a warrant out for his you know, arrest. Murder but, charges usually tend to take precedence. Even yeah. like uh, generally that's considered the most heinous crime. Um, yeah. So, it, I mean, even if you compare that to, you know, a 20 billion, whatever it was, um, or not 20 billion, but 1.6 billion drug smuggling operation yeah. in the States, even compared to that, they might say, no, the murder is the more important charge. So, you, I mean, you, you could be right. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you look, there's been, there's been constant work on it. The Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau weren't just, you know, gathering all the information on them for their amusement. I mean, they, they clearly have been investigating him with the end game to see him standing in the special criminal court charged with yeah. something, be it directing a, a, a criminal organization or a murder, if they can link him to it. I think the Spanish situation that they are investigating, the money laundering, that has to be where Junior, Christopher Kinahan Jr. is headed, I think, <laughs> possibly. And then the Americans are on board. So is 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 Senior... Senior for the States, the States and Daniel for back home in Ireland. Yeah. Quite possibly. Are, are all three of them going to the States? I'm hedging my bets here. I'm going to, you know, if I was betting on a horse knows, here, I'd be going knows? each way. I mean, but I think that I would be most confident in Daniel Kinahan certainly being wanted here. Now, in the background, of course, as all this is going on, there's thousands and millions of decrypted messages from a number of phone hacks. Enetcom. EncroChat, Sky ECC, uh, Anon. Uh, there's another privacy one I can't remember. But the Dutch have been at the forefront of that. And there are millions of messages. And certainly we know from court cases in the Netherlands, from El Rico's case, that the phones got him. The Marengo trial is all about that encrypt, decrypted messages and how they are proving so the states say that uh, Rido and Taghi was directing operations and murders from his base in Dubai through the phone network. So these are all being untangled and that'll take more time. But undoubtedly, it's the phones that have got them all. It's been, it's been huge. And I know like we haven't we've, we've rarely seen them referenced in court cases in the south in mm. Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and I think there's a view that they wouldn't hold up. They wouldn't pass the test. They wouldn't eventually get past the Supreme Court, that it wouldn't be enough, that it's at best it's circumstantial evidence. And I think there's also a view a- among some guards that it's, it's just intelligence. It's like, it's like somebody has told you about something and that there's no evidential value at all and that you, you really just have to get what you, what you can glean from these messages. And, and use that's then the to most find arrogant the evidence. view of and all. That's, uh, and that's, that's coming from crime and security and it's arrogance, absolute arrogance. And it's not up to individual officers to decide what will stand up in a court of law or not. No, I look, I mean, it's you know? it, like there, there, there have been, as far as I remember, there have been a, a case in France now where it was successfully challenged. So, I mean, it, it is up for grabs, <laughs> like in terms <laughs> of what, what, your head under what the happens. Table, oh, but, uh, here. <laughs> but look, it, it does, it, like it remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, 
like it, but there is i mean there is that as you like behind the scenes there is efforts going um uh, like things like the appointment of a of a, a detective who's now based in colombia and is, mm, is, is mm. important. And now as well, I think Drew Harris also announced this week that they're sending out a detective superintendent out to the UAE. Yeah. So that might be our version of the Italian minister going out, trying to get somebody to, you know, sent back. I mean, you know, the fact that you have a, and that's not an insignificant rank to send mm. out. I mean, we don't have detective superintendents growing on trees as far as I know. Um, well, you know, look, it's been an extraordinary time. It's been an extraordinary 10 years to be a crime journalist, I have to say. I think it's, it's this has all made the job absolutely incredible. Um, there's rarely a dull day. These have been really changing times. I think those encrypted phones have been behind a lot of it. But it's almost like you'd wonder, I mean, this is European narcos, right? Is this it, season one, though? It's is there absolutely something only else season coming one. up behind? Well, like. Christy Kinnan and Daniel Kinnan isn't the only drug dealer like that we have doorstepped. Don't mm. forget, mm. the penguin is still out there, mm. um, and you, you know that's potentially. Mitch is in his seventies now. Surely he doesn't have it in him to do. By I mean, all he accounts, he was always as big, if not bigger, mm. and that was the view of you know some very experienced people. If we are coming to the end of season one, Narcos, you know, we're on the last episode, yeah. I doubt it. I think there's another couple of episodes to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the popcorn. Like, uh, I mean, who, yeah. who's going to fly out now to, to Philadelphia or Washington for the, the trial of mm. one of the Kinnahans? Or I am. Okay, well, then I, I'll go to Spain then for... Uh, yeah, I'll go to a whole <laughs> lot of them. I'll be kept going. Well, look, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, it's it's all over till the final curtain. But we do, I mean, the next big story that we're going to be on frantically talking about here when it comes to the Kinnahans will be their arrests. There's no question of that. I think they know themselves that the clock is ticking. I think they've been trying to shore up what they can as regards money. They have a lot of money owed to them. A lot of people are not paying up because the, you know, the house cards has collapsed. You know, you see a company going under, you maybe would be tempted yourself not to pay your bill. And um, that's they're living. They're still in the United Arab Emirates, despite all the reports and all the spin that they're elsewhere. Uh, they are there and they are just playing a waiting game. I think every night they go to bed, they're wondering, will 5 a.m. be, you know, the time that they do Every night probably in. a different bed. Just every to... night probably a different bed. But nonetheless, they will be wondering if the doors are kicked in. And I don't think that they have influence enough. To beat this, I don't think any human. But being it's becoming can beat too the power of. It's the, becoming too expensive, yeah. like you know, reputationally or whatever, to protect them. Like it's just you know they're they're. Uh, it's way too polite a term. They're too hot a potato. Like yeah. you know, they're just yeah. too hot to handle. Like yeah. you know, I mean, uh, you know, nobody's going to want to be seen standing next to them. You mm -hmm. know, not posing on Twitter. Apart from the fact that you might be able to go to Disneyland, I think there might be more serious ramifications. So you know, was it worth it all? That's something maybe he will eventually talk to one of us instead of keeping right. stum when we doorstep him. Or maybe he'll, um, you know, have plenty of time in a cell to consider that. Because I, I, I often wonder, like, you know, when you go from that kind of lifestyle, when you go from that enormous wealth and I suppose the paranoia and everything, and all of a sudden you find yourself with nothing, not even your freedom. I mean... Yeah, but look, any time you, you speak to... You know, someone from that background, they tend to be very self-serving. I mm -hmm. mean, different people over the years, like if you do doorstep them, it, the likes of Gilligan, you know, comes out with, you know, just bizarre weirdness, you yeah. know, and it's all, it's all about, he's a wronged man, he's, he's misunderstood, he's yeah. you know, and yeah. we, we've heard that over the years from, from various people. I mean, if, you, if you're talking to somebody who's been involved in crime, but they're, you know, a genuine victim, you know, people like Joey O'Callaghan, you'll get the truth. Mm. But like, you know, people who are at the other end of it, though, who've been calling the shots and ordering, you know, people like a young Joey Callahan to do do this or do that, they they'll have a kind of a, a different view. Uh, you know, they'll have mm -hmm. a they'll be able to justify it in their minds. We, you know, we said that earlier. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's a strange psychology that kind of puts you in that position that, you know, you're 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 a murdering drug dealer. Yet you can be a loving father who doesn't always try to drown your kids in the pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, right, well, that'll do for now. And, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, the next holiday I go on won't be the time they'll be arrested. I hope I'll be back here in Ireland for that. I'll send you a postcard from the States <laughs> to say, sorry, Nicola, I beat you to it. <laughs>
All right. Thanks a million, Eamon. Thanks, Nicola.